In the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Today's Gospel lesson is a bit odd on its own, if we are honest. Here's the scene. There are ten bridesmaids, they're waiting on the groom for the wedding party, and they have to take some lamps with them because it may get dark, and five of them bring only the oil in the lamps, and five of them bring extra oil. Now at midnight, when the groom finally arrives, they go into the party with him, but only the ones with the extra oil, because the ones who had only brought the oil in the lamps run out. And when they ask those who brought extra for some, they really are kind of rude, and they say no. And so the five who didn't bring extra oil have to run to like CVS or something to try and find some extra oil. And in the interim, the door to the party shuts and they can't get in and they're left out in the darkness and the cold. So what are we supposed to get from this story that Jesus tells? Now there are many different ways that people have turned this story, but for me, at least in my humble opinion, there are many different ways that are really quite miss the point. This is not really a story about staying alert, because we see that they fall asleep, so it can't really be about that. It's not really a story about needing to bring everything to the party with us, because they really didn't bring much, if anything, only their lamps. It's not really about being patient, because it never really says anything about their feelings, and it's certainly not something about knowing the groom ahead of time, whether we should or should not know the groom, because they all seem to know him, right? Even the five that don't bring extra oil seem to say, hey, wait for us, as if they have a relationship, and yet the groom does not. And so if we want to dig into this story and say, what is really different about the two sets of bridesmaids, the only real difference is that one half of them brought extra oil. They were prepared in a way that allowed them to wait and take advantage of the opportunity of the groom and the party. Being prepared is a central idea for us in our Christian life, but that preparation is not something that looks like Armageddon or end of the world type stuff, but rather this sort of constant and vigilant preparedness, looking all the time in our world for the love of one another and the love of Christ. Now, I'm a bit of a news junkie. I love the news. I listen to news all the time. I read news all the time. I kind of pride myself in knowing what's going on in the world, and I'm a bit of a snob when it comes to knowing the names of world leaders and things like that. I love that stuff. And I believe that knowing what's going on in the world is not something that we can be privileged to do But in fact, knowing what's going on in the world outside these walls, the complexity and the mess of it all, is actually our call as Christian people. And why? Because Jesus calls us to love one another, to love our neighbor. And if we don't know what's going on with our neighbor, then how can we possibly love them? Now that kind of knowledge is sort of like a sacred preparation. When we seek to know our neighbor well, to know what's going on with them, to engage and learn from our neighbors, then we are prepared to actually love them the way that Christ calls us to love. Unfortunately, what many people in the world seem to do these days is not really try to learn from our neighbors, but to listen enough to them to then better defend our own positions, right? Because we know best. There's a word for this idea. It's called trolling. How many of you are familiar with trolls? Now, trolls have been around for a long, long time. We've all talked about the story of the Israelites, and in essence, you had trolling all the way. But now, with media constantly swirling around us, trolls have a lot of access to just ruin our day. I recently saw a post from a colleague who said, those who can, do. Those who can't use the comment section to point out what others did as not perfect. And it seems like that's really the way that the world has become. As things get more ugly, we can choose to simply check out. But here's the big problem. 
When we stop seeking to know our neighbor, to know what's going on with our neighbor, we seek to be able to truly love them. When we let that anger and fear start to drag us out of the world in some way into our little bubble, we really stop seeking Christ in one another. Being prepared to see Christ in the world is getting harder. Now, as I mentioned, I'm a news junkie. And so I was real excited a couple weeks ago when I found out that my sixth grade son, Braden, told me he had to listen to the news every day for one week in order to check off a requirement for one of his merit badges. I thought, what a great thing for us to do, listen to the news together and then discuss the news. Except the week we chose to listen to the news was this past week. Have you listened to the news with a young person recently? This past week was such a wreck in the world. We had stories from the tragic murders that happened in Sutherland Springs. We heard over and over again about our leaders bickering back and forth and trying to posture with one another in order to win. And then, of course, we had story after story, like salt in the wound, of how men use their power to abuse and take advantage of other people, victimized, frustrated, and angry, I had to try and figure out how to tell my son how to be Christian in that kind of world. And I'm sure I'm not alone. How many of us are afraid to even look at our phones in the morning to see what happened overnight? When story after story seems to bring us down, is that really the world that Jesus calls us into? The answer is yes. The good news is this. We are not alone in seeking the goodness in the world, in working hard to love one another in this crazy world. Look around. If for no, nothing else, we are in it together. But it's not just us. God travels with us every day, works through us every day to try and spread that light and that goodness and that hope in a world that is so dark so often. We come here together to seek the peace of Christ, to be filled with that hopefulness. And let me be clear. The world has truly become God's mission field. We are being called to leave this place and go out into what is now truly a mission field for hope and love. When we meet God here, when we sing God's praises, when we pray together for those in our lives, when we receive the bread of life and the cup of salvation, we are renewed and re-inspired to go out in the world looking for Christ. We know life is not fair. Hopefully we have all figured that out at this point. People will hurt us, disappoint us. Loved ones will get sick. We will lose in our careers at some point. Life is not fair. And yet, every week we are called back to be attentive to what God is doing for each one of us every day. We are called back here in order to, in many ways, take the extra oil with us out there. You see, Christ is everywhere, ready to surprise us with joy, ready to remind us of the hopefulness that we receive in faith. And so it's our call to be prepared. It's our call to come here together to renew one another, to find our rootedness and our connection to God and Christ, and then to go out there and find Christ even in the weirdest, most angry, most dark places of the world. We are in it together. And when we travel the way together, we, in small and sometimes big ways, spread the light of Christ to the dark world. That's some good news.
Thanks be to God. Amen.